I want to preach for a few moments out of Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3. And I want to preach on perfect peace. Perfect peace. I promise you it's one of those messages that the enemy does not want communicated to the body of Christ. It's one of those sermons that he does not want conveyed to anybody. At a level of Christianity from uh, newborn Christian, we have them today, uh, to those that have come back to the Lord, to those that have been serving God for many years. It's perfect peace. There's something so powerful about perfect peace. Without peace, you're not going to sleep at night. Without peace, you're going to be agitated. Without peace, you're constantly on the search and the lookout for something to give you peace of mind. You'll be constantly looking for something to cause the tremors to stop and the nervousness to go away. Without peace, you'll look over your shoulder at a constant pace. Without peace, you'll have no joy in your life at all. I want to talk today how we're going to get our perfect peace, how we're going to maintain it, and how we're not going to let it go. Tell your neighbor, I'm not letting it go. In Isaiah 26 and verse 1, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open you the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. I want you to memorize that and I want you to ever forget it. Verse number three, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth, because he trusteth. There is a contingency because he trusteth in thee. Father, I love you today and I thank you for your goodness, your grace and your mercy. Father God, in a minimal amount of time, let me take every opportunity to take the word of God as if a sower is sowing seed and reach in, Father God, and share it. Take the seed, which is the word of God, and share it in this blessed congregation. Father, we love you. We bless you and we thank you for it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And let everybody say amen and amen. Let's just clap our hands and say, God, thank you already. Thank you already for what you're doing. Thank you for your blessings. We've been preaching on Wednesday nights, at least this last Wednesday, and we have in time past preached on spiritual warfare. And I don't know that there's ever been a time where I've been able to go this deep in study to prepare for a series on spiritual warfare like that we have now. I want us to be reminded as much as we reminded you Wednesday and will continue to should the Lord tarry and his strength will continue to help us and keep us. Hallelujah. And by his will, we understand that as long as we're living, there will always be an element of spiritual warfare. There's always going to be things you have to go through. There's always going to be a target on us, on you, on the fellowship, and on the church. That target is a target to take away anything that God is aiding and abetting. Anything where his spirit is, anywhere where his fellowship is, where the joy of the Lord is my strength and it's proclaimed from the rooftops and in every pulpit of America that Jesus is alive and well, you're going to have some spiritual warfare. You can call it personality perplexities. You can call it personality twerks. You can call it all kinds of things that just go in all kinds of different mechanisms and manners. And I know what I'm saying because I've seen people that I thought were one way and just completely do something different, herky-jerky. And I'm sorry I got to say what I've got to say. Can I get a witness in the house? There is spiritual warfare that's always trying to come in between the people of God. So know you're going to face it, but know that this is not a fight in the natural. There's no need to get a hold of people that are getting on your nerves or frustrating you because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We don't fight out here. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Everybody needs to understand there is a stronghold somewhere you are constantly going to have to try to fight. 
Philippians 2, 2 says, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Going on to verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let me say to our church, as much as I would make a clarion call that we need unity, it doesn't start just in the body of Christ. It starts with the head. And from the head, it flows to the leadership. Jesus broke the bread, blessed it, gave to the disciples, and the disciples passed it out. I believe that it is the tier of leadership that's around me, that's beyond us, that are team leads and that are over departments that have to be in unity. If we're in schism and division there, it will begin to flow into the rest of the body of Christ. Leadership has to be in unity. It means from a pastoral standpoint, a church standpoint, a governmental standpoint, and I mean that in a secular system as well. That is why you see the upheaval, the fighting, the mess, the arguments, the tyranny that's going on because there is no unity. We are the United States of America because we have borders and state lines and that's about it. We are not united. There is so many people that are against one another and that's why we need unity in the church because we're not participating in politics. I'm trying to mind my manners. Let me tell you, saints of God, you will need the help of the Lord. You will need the help of the Lord when it comes to maintaining perfect peace. Because most of the changes that we will address in this service today will be changes you will need God to help you make in your mind. And you know when I do, pe know that people do not like change. People do not like change. But if you can get your mind to line up with your spirit and take the limitations off of God, you will have won most of the battle right there. Let me go on to say whatever attracts you will distract you. And ultimately, it will control you. The word of God says in Romans 6, 16, no, you're not. That to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. Whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. You have two options when you leave this place. Sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Two options. There's no middle line. There is not a fine line. There's not a gray area. It is real black and white. One side is sin unto death. The other side is obedience unto righteousness. And whatever you yield to, whether I get 20 hands clapping or not, or no amens at all, I'm going to keep on preaching. I come to tell you that right now. I don't mean to sound arrogant, but I mean to get real bold with the spirit here. I'm not going to let the enemy back me up, nor hell. It's real black and white. It's real plain. It's right there in the pages of God's word. It is sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. And whatever you yield to, whatever you allow your gates to hear, whatever you allow your gates to see, whatever you allow your gates to feel, whatever emotion you allow to get into your system chemically and get moved by it, moved by what you see, moved and intrigued by what you see going on in a video or otherwise, that will be what you yield to. If you yield to the Lord, you're going to experience the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Righteousness. If you yield to God, you're going to have a happy life. And if you're a husband, a happy wife. You're going to have happy babies and happy family time. But it's when sin gets in the camp that Achan found it messed everything up. That is why it is obedience under righteousness. I'm just calling for people to go back to obedience to the Lord. Stop listening to every wind of doctrine. Stop listening of every whim of the enemy. And just know that you you have got to get your mind made up and get your eyes on Jesus. You better understand that there is a blessing in your obedience. There is joy in the journey and there's peace of mind when you give it to God. Hallelujah. Let me say that when you purposefully sin, you are yielding to sin. 
by default you yield to sin. You cannot expect the blessings of God or the peace of God forfeiting your future by playing with fire. The Bible said that a man cannot take fire in his bosom without being burned, without being affected. Something is going to happen when you start to play with a cancerous tumor called sin. Something is going to happen. Decay is going to settle in. Life begins to ooze out. The expectation of longevity gets lost because sin is like a cancer. It will eat at you dear sir and ma'am. It will decay your spiritual life. It comes to kill and steal and destroy. You might not have known that you were walking into an old time church. But I come to tell you today that I'm making it real plain. If the enemy wants to tell you how good his crack is, I'm here to tell you how good Christ is. I'm here to tell you he's a mighty God. I'm here to tell you there's joy in serving Jesus. I don't mind making it plain. In Ephesians 4, 22 to 23, I'm going to throw a lot of scripture out today that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You put off concerning the cor- former conversation like the old man. You're not going to talk like you used to talk. You're not going to think like you used to think because oftentimes when you get into battles and spiritual warfare hits, what I feel like saying, what I should have said is not going to be what you feel like saying and it's not going to be what you should have said. When you go into spiritual warfare, you understand the old man would have acted that way. The old man would have responded accordingly. But because there's a new life inside of you, because you've been saved from the former conversation, you're not going to talk like you used to talk. You're not going to put stuff on Facebook like you used to put on Facebook. I'm going to get up in your business now. You're not going to tweet like what you used to tweet. You're not going to put stuff on Instagram like you used to. When you get new in Jesus Christ, everything becomes new. My walk is different. My talk is different. My mind is different. My concept is different because I put off the old man. You're going to conversate like a Christian. Matthew 12, 34. Oh, generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Truly, what came out of your heart last week shot right out of your mouth if some of you want to know what you're thinking about what your mind's going through what your body's thinking go over the last seven days of conversations and see what it said run the tape back push rewind listen to Monday's conversation don't get quiet on me now and don't be thinking for somebody else in the church I'm talking to you right now rewind it (laughs) come on my God we got to laugh a little bit in the middle of this. Because whatever you've been saying, come right up out of your heart. Whatever you've been saying, come right up out of your heart. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you've been talking about people, you've got some bitterness in your heart. If there are people that you've been talking about, I wish I could see them go under. You've got some madness in your heart. I wish I could see them fall down real good. Then there's some things in your heart that you need to get taken care of. There is something in that heart that needs to get extracted. That bitterness and frustration and hateful spirit has got to come out of there. You have got to stop stereotyping all kinds of people that look like the guy that hurts you or the woman that done you wrong. you got to let it go. Come on, even churches. Churches didn't hurt you. Somebody in that establishment hurts you so get up and shout I'm moving on today that's the last day it's not going to come out of my mouth one more Isaiah 26 and 3 help me Jesus thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee do we trust God do we trust God And there it is. 
The perfect plan to perfect peace is to trust God. Some of you came in with wrestling with stuff. God tried to take it from you, wrestled it back. Oh, I know I need to let it go. God says, give it to me. No, I'm holding on to this. They did me wrong and I can't let it go. I'm holding on to it. That person in that church, they crossed me and I can't let it go. It's easy. Just let him have it. Let him have it. Do you trust God with it? Do you trust God to take care of it? Do you trust God to fix it? I'm telling you, I've been crossed and double crossed and triple crossed. There have been people that stuck a knife in my back and spun it and twisted it. But I never got to tell my side of the story. I never got to say what, what, what had happened was. I never get to tell everybody, well, my side was this. You just have to go on sometimes. I have had to trust God to give him all my mess, all my struggles, all of my frustration, all of my aggravation, all of the trials I've been through. I had to let God have it. I had to say as long as I have it, it's going to eat me up. But I've got to let God have it because I don't trust me with it, but I do God. I talk to people all the time. Oftentimes it's a pastor that's been hurt. Oftentimes it's a pastor that doesn't even want to bring a name up of the individual because they know I know the individual. And I think to myself, how do these things happen? But I continually tell them at the end of the day and at the end of the conversation, you've got to trust God with this. You've got to trust God that the Lord's doing something bigger than what you're wrapping your mind around. You've got to let God have this. If you're right where God wants you to be, you're going to have to trust God. Some of you have got to learn to trust God. There are people, the bottom line, right here, let me preach. You are not at perfect peace because you're not trusting God. You're not letting God have it. Gideon, Gideon said, God, I'm having trouble really believing that this is going to happen. Do you know what Gideon did then? Because he wanted peace about it. He could not go into a battle without peace about it. So he laid a fleece out. He said, God, one night he said, wet it. And the next night he said, let everything around it be wet and the fleece dry. And God did it. And here he is because he had a problem trusting God. You have got sometimes to lay a fleece out about stuff. God, if this is your will, then Lord, these things are going to happen and I'll know it's you. But if it's not your will, then God, I'm walking away. And you have to stand right in the middle of it, stretched by both of them, and say, one of you I've got to let go of. I dare you to stand up and shout, one of you has got to go. Everybody stand up with everybody else. High five a few hands and shout, do you trust him? Do we really trust him? Do we really trust him? Do we really trust him? Or do we only trust him with things that don't mean that much to us? Do we really trust him? Or is it the things we really, really have to hold on to I can't trust him with? And the question is, it's not the small things that you don't mind you trust him with. It's the things you really care for. Do you trust him with it? Hallelujah, Jesus. You got to let it go. Push your neighbor and say, let it go. I'm not going to beat up on you too much longer. There's two names in the Bible. They're spelled like this, Jochebed, Amram. But if you pronounce them correctly, it's Jochebed. You got to put a little spit in there. (laughs) Amram. (laughs) Those are actually, if you know who those people are, that's Moses' daddy and mama. And let me tell you, they were both born out of the Levitical tribe. And we find out they had three children in the word of God. They had Miriam, they had Aaron, And they had a little baby boy, Moses. And what happened was, at the beginning of the chapter, there was a new Pharaoh that came in. He didn't know Joseph and the people. And when he came in, he started saying, who are these 
people that you've enslaved here in Egypt. And they started saying, those are the Hebrews, the children of Israel. And he said, I want you to put taskmasters over them. These people are going to end up multiplying. And as they end up multiplying, they're going to end up battling us and winning. He got insecure. He got afraid because God was getting ready to bring them out of there. So he summons two Hebrew midwives to go and make certain that when the Hebrews sit on a stool and a baby is coming, that's the wording in the scripture, you kill that male factor. They reported back because not only were the little girls saved and never died, but it was the little boys we're living too. And they said, hey, what are you doing? They said, we can't help it. When we go to get them, them Hebrew women, they're lively people. We don't know what it is about them. You know, they had to be Pentecostals. Come on. They were having babies before they could even get there. And Moses ends up in the middle of all of that. Moses ends up being born. And Moses is born. And the Bible said, Mama looked at him and said, he's a fair child. He's a beautiful child. There's favor on his life. And so she took him and she put him in an ark of bulrushes. And she stuck him in the flags. And the other way, in other words, at the brink of the river, right there at the brink, she knew to put him right there. And he sat there and he started crying. And Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe herself, which is customary of the royal people and they came down and Moses was crying and she named him Moses because he was drawn out of the water now let me ask you a question if it was your baby boy if it was three to connect and make the entire family would you would you like for God to tell you to go put that baby where the alligators and the crocodiles and the snakes and God knows whatever else would you like to take your baby there but when you've got a mandate from God and you know it had to be God you don't have a problem letting go of something and putting it in the river go and push on your neighbor a little bit right there when she could not hide him when she could not hide him there are some of you that cannot hide what God is getting ready to do and you're wrestling with it and you're hanging on to it and you just got to let it go. You got to let stuff go. Let stuff roll off your back. Be willing to take the thing that's your prized possession and give it back to God and say, this isn't my will, but your will. This isn't about me. It's about the kingdom. Start loving people instead of being mad at them and aggravated everybody that doesn't treat you like royalty. Go on and let it run off of you. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. We are the people of God we are in the army of the Lord y'all better put your boots on and get ready I come to tell you I'm not preaching some strange lesson I've not been through I'm preaching something right now that I feel the elasticity getting thin <laughs> I feel God pulling on me to come out of my comfort zone and do things he's never asked me to do before. And getting in places I've never been before. In the righteous sector, by the way. Thank you, God. And he's stretching me. And he's asking me, give me that. Give me that. And you have to be willing to let him have it. You really trust God? Show him. Don't just give him lip service. Man, I don't mean to be so bold, but I can't apologize for this. It's like being a prophet. It's one thing to say you're a prophet. It's another thing you to tell me something ain't nobody else knows, then we'll know you're a prophet. It's easy to say, oh, I trust God. Well, then jump in the boat. I trust God. Then go do what he told you to do. I trust God. Then go lay that thing on the altar. I trust God. Then let God have your husband. I trust God. Let God have your babies. I trust God. Let God have your wife, sir. I trust God. Then put it in God's hands. If you trust him, put it in. Romans 8 verse 7. The carnal mind is enmity against God. The carnal mind, I tell you, it's crazy. The carnal mind says it doesn't make any sense. The carnal mind says, Whoa, hallelujah, Jesus. 
What's he doing that for? That's a carnal mind. Woo, hallelujah. I felt God. What made him do that? The carnal mind will question because the natural man receives not the things of God for he cannot receive them. Hallelujah. That's the, the carnal mind always wants to shut down anything God's doing. The carnal mind always wants to create negativity and be a critic. The carnal mind wants to keep you apprehended as opposed to loosen you. Romans 8, 27 says the spirit has a mind. He that searcheth the hearts knows what's the mind of the spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Ephesians 4, 23 says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. I can't go on yesterday's refreshing. I can't go on yesterday's mindset. It held me up a couple times. It needs renewed. It needs refreshed. Sometimes you have to turn off your phone. It's been on for two weeks because it's picking up algorithms of bad habits. And so you power it down. Give it a break. Sometimes your screen needs refreshed. Sometimes I need a drink of water because I'm parched and I need refreshed. Sometimes people just need refreshed. This is a stark reminder that if you want peace of mind, it's not going to be in a lot of the places that you thought you could go get it. 25 bucks a hit doesn't give you peace of mind. Five dollar bag won't give you hope. <laughs> oh, a little bit of something in my veins isn't going to give me what I need. But I'm telling you, there is a crimson flow of the blood of Calvary that's going to flow into this house and give you redemption, restoration and salvation <laughs> Romans 12 1 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service you want to know what your reasonable service is that you present your body a living sacrifice that means this whole thing is dead I'm not going to be moved by somebody talking about something that already died I'm not going to get I'm not going to get critical. <laughs> I'm not going to get offended. Hallelujah. It's already gone. It's dead. I am alive in Christ. That's why the Bible says when it talks about being conformed by the renewing of your mind. Conform means to fashion a light to the patterns of God. Transformed is metamorpho, which is the process of metamorphosis. It means to transfigure, to change, to transform. And your nature has to change. Your nature has to change. And stop saying, by the way, if I get saved, I'm going to change. No, God's going to change you. Won't he do it? <laughs> I said, God is going to change you. Stop saying, I'm going to clean myself up. God's job is to clean you up. I'm going to make things right. God's going to make things right. The only thing you're in charge of is saying, God, here I am. God, clean up my mouth. Clean up my mess. Clean up my mind. Clean up my heart. God, do it. God, do it. Just let him hook you and he'll clean you up. Perfect peace. I have to pray about things. I have to put it in God's hands. Sometimes I, if it's big, I have to lay a fleece out. I have to say, God, I really need to know about this. I really need to know what you're saying. Yesterday morning, I was sitting there. I was studying. I was researching, researching, studying, researching, studying. And then all of a sudden, even Jill come in. I, I grabbed her grandparents' old rocking chair, which we have up si uh, upstairs in our in our area where our office is located, just adjacent, connected to our bedroom. And I'm sitting in that big brown rocking chair and I've got my Bible in my lap and I just happened to open up and I hear the Holy Ghost say, read these two books. And I started about the second chapter and I got down through there and I read that and read the other. Then I just flipped over into the book of Luke and found another scripture pertinent to my circumstance. And I heard the Lord speaking to me out of one of his scripture. I have to have peace when I know that God has something for my life. You better have peace about every decision that you have. You better have peace about who you marry. Some of y'all need to tell your children, you better have a peace about who you marry. If you have any slight apprehension at all, you better dig in there and you better investigate why you have apprehension. Hallelujah. 
praise God, I can't get no head nod. I can't get no, I can't believe he's saying it. I can't get an amen in the house. I'm going to move my lips closer to this microphone so I know you can hear what I'm saying. You better have a piece about everything you get yourself into. Because sometimes your mind and body will get you, get you into something that only the Spirit of God can bring you out of. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You better have a peace about it. Have a peace about it. Have a peace about it. God delivered me from motorcycles. If you have one, good for you. I pray you wear a helmet and body gear. And your new bike has airbags. And people around you aren't texting. Hallelujah. But I prayed. I prayed for a dirt bike. And I had to have peace about it before I got it. Now, Jill, she's a little different about me having one of them things. She preferred me to just put it right out there for sale. Because I got one of them you can ride on the road. But I just normally just ride it in the grass. Not around my front yard at home. Thank you, Lord. But I had to have a piece about it. I had to have a piece. There, there's things right now, there are some heavy decisions. If you saw the weight, it would be bending the bar on my back because they're heavy decisions and that I can't pull the trigger on them until I have a piece about it. Until I know God says to me, I'm in it now. Because sometimes it's God waiting on us to say and do the right things, to have the right angle at it, to know, okay, let's go. Like this whole building process. I'm praying a couple months ago and the Lord speaks to me. You're not going to get your staff and leadership team prepared when you build the buildings. You're going to do that now. I'm going to build your buildings later. And I said, God, I stand corrected. That's what I'll do. God wants to speak to us and get things in perspective. We want things, but God is saying, you don't have a piece about it right now because you're not asking me all the details. And when you really get the details from God, he'll work it out for you. When you have the peace of God about it, it doesn't matter. It's never rained, God. Build the boat anyway. Build enough for animals, for and your three sons, their wives, and your wife. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Go on in there. Get in there, Noah. Get your family. God, it's never, it's, this, this makes no sense. But... Nevertheless, I'll do it anyway. What did Jesus continue to say at the very last? Not my will, but your will be done. When you look at life in the lens of God, not my will, but your will, then it's done. It may not look like in here during service that I make a lot of sacrifices. No, don't get quiet on me now. You've not seen life behind the scenes. You've not seen the pacing and the walking. You've not seen the time when the lights are off and I come in and it's a pace back and forth. And then if it's really bad, I'm huddled up here in the corner just, just trusting God. I'm not panicking. I'm just trusting God saying, Lord, I need this last detail because this needs to get done. Are you with me? I want to have perfect peace about it. I'm not just impacting Todd Hoskins' life. Thank you. Everything changes and darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring.